Hello, welcome to the final section of our course on informal fallacies. Today I will talk to you about our class so far, where have we uh, been, uh, what have we learned, and then where are we going. Then I will talk to you about the distinction between formal and informal fallacies. And finally, we will cover the category of informal fallacy called personal attacks. So, what have we learned in this class so far? Here's the structure of our class. In the first section, I introduced you to reasoning. Uh, second section, we uh, looked at propositional logic to prove that uh, uh, for a given argument, uh, it was either valid or invalid. Then we looked at induction a little more closely, and we looked at two kinds of arguments uh, moral arguments and analogical arguments. Finally, uh, we're going to look at informal fallacies. So in the first section of the course, we learned about statements and arguments and how to distinguish them from other uses of language. Then we learned the difference between deductive and inductive arguments and the various properties for each, such as validity, soundness, strength, and cogency. Furthermore, we learned a method for proving whether a given deductive argument is valid or invalid, the truth table method. Finally, uh, not finally, um, but we also learned about moral arguments. We learned about value judgments, moral theories, and the structure of moral arguments. And then finally, we learned about analogical arguments. We learned about their structure and how to analyze them. Then we looked at two contemporary examples of analogical argumentation in the philosophical literature. Okay, now we'll learn about informal fallacies. Why are we doing all this? Well, I want you to become better and more independent thinkers. So that, for example, when you're reading the New York Times and uh, the author is making an argument, you're able to track with the argument and you're able to see whether or not the argument is good or bad. Perhaps you can even uh, do a truth table on it to determine its validity. Just kidding. Okay, so if we're going to talk about informal fallacies, we have to know the distinction between formal and informal fallacies. So a fallacy, just broadly, is a defect in an argument that consists in something other than false premises alone. So here's one defect in an argument. A false premise. So an argument might be totally flawless except that it has one false premise. Okay, we wouldn't call that a fallacy. We would say, you know, it fails in having a false premise or we would say um, we uh, it fails in its uh, truth value, something like that. A fallacy would be any defect in an argument that consists in something other than false premises. And we have two kinds of fallacy. Formal and informal. Here's a formal fallacy. A logical error that occurs in the form or the structure of a deductive argument. A logical error that occurs in the form or the structure of a deductive argument. Here's an example of an argument that's, um, we'll take it to be deductive, and that commits a, a fallacy, a formal fallacy. All beagles are dogs, all poodles are dogs. Therefore, all beagles are poodles. Now, obviously, um, the conclusion isn't true. But look at the premises. All beagles are dogs. Is that true? Yes. All poodles are dogs. Is that true? Yes. But is it true that all beagles are poodles? No. So something about the form of this argument has gone wrong. So we we can see that it's invalid because it has true premises and a false conclusion. So here's the form. All B are D, all P are D, therefore all B are P. And we can recognize that that form is uh, no bueno. So we can say that this argument commits a formal fallacy. Now, an informal fallacy is a mistake in reasoning that doesn't occur in the form of the argument. If we go back to the previous slide, we can see what's wrong with this argument is that the, the form is messed up. 
this form is bad. What that means is that even if the premises are true, the conclusion doesn't follow. So a, an informal fallacy would be a mistake that doesn't occur in the form of the argument. So even a, even a valid argument can be informally fallacious. Take a look at the argument I have there. The moon is round, therefore the moon is round. This is valid. If the premise is true, the conclusion must be true. There's no way around it. So it's not formally fallacious, but it's it's informal. It commits an informal fallacy. Uh, real quick, let's look down here at the truth table. You can see for yourself that this is formally valid. You know, I've done a truth table on this quick truth table. Here's a premise. Here's a conclusion. Whenever the premise is true. The conclusion is true. Whenever the premise is false, the conclusion is false. So it's impossible for the premise to be true and the conclusion to be false. Okay, but what's wrong with this argument? You might have already guessed. It's not going to be very convincing to anyone unless they already accept that the moon is round. So if you're talking to a flat mooner, right, um, someone who believes in a flat moon, well, if you say, I have an argument uh, that, that, that the uh, moon is actually round, here it goes. The moon is round, therefore the moon is round. You know, the person who believes that the moon is flat is, is going to just say, well, that's not convincing because basically all you did was um, repeat your statement that the moon is round. You need to give me some sort of, you know, empirical evidence that the moon is, is not flat or that the moon is round? Okay, so we call this begging the question. An argument begs the question when it assumes in the premises the very thing it's trying to prove by the conclusion. So we've already assumed that the moon is round in order to conclude that the moon is round. Uh, another way, another um, name for this sort of reasoning is called circular reasoning. You're not giving any sort of outside evidence beyond the conclusion to show that the conclusion is true. So even a valid argument can commit a formal in an informal fallacy. All right, here's our summary regarding fallacies. An argument can go wrong in three ways. It can have false premises. It can have bad form. Or it can make an error that is not due to having false premises or bad form. That third category would be the category of informal fallacy. It's really a kind of a catch-all category because it's it's just saying whatever isn't uh, whatever error you know isn't due to false premises and bad form is an informal fallacy. So, in our section on informal fallacies, we're really just going to look at some sort of families of fallacies, and I'm sure there are uh, many more. Um, kinds of fallacies or families of fallacies that are covered in this book, but this will give you an idea of some of the main sort of errors in reasoning. All right, so now let's talk about personal attacks. This is a family of informal fallacy. A personal a personal attack is when you attack a person rather than their argument or claim. You attack a person rather than their argument or claim. And this doesn't mean necessarily that someone gives you an argument so you hit them with a stick, right? Uh, it, it could be that you're insulting them. It could be that you're saying they're a bad person so I don't have to be, you don't have to believe what they say, that kind of thing. Um, so it's fallacious because uh, character, when you say you're attacking someone's character, is usually irrelevant to the truth or falsity of a person's claims or the merits of their argument. So here's an example that's obviously, obviously fallacious. John says that the earth is round. Well, you know, he can't be right about that. After all, he cheats on his wife. All right, so it's a silly example, but 
John's claim that the earth is round, you know, whether or not you should believe that has, um, doesn't have much to do with whether or not he, he cheats on his wife. So if you, if you say, no, I can't believe that the earth is round, you know, John says that the earth is round. He cheats on his wife. Well, you, I guess you don't understand uh, the nature of, you know, um, the, of, of uh, the truth or falsity of a claim. What makes the claim that the earth is round false? Well, it has nothing to do with John's character. So with an informal fallacy of personal attack, you're attacking the person's character or their life circumstance or something like that, rather than looking at the argument or the claim that they're making itself and sort of analyzing this claim or the argument itself. Okay, so here you've got a picture of Hitler, you've got a picture of Mother Teresa, and you can see that an argument is sound, whether it's made by Hitler or Mother Teresa. So here's a sound argument. It's um, valid, and it has true premises. If Keith is a person, that's me, then he is valuable. Keith is a person, therefore Keith is valuable. This has the form of modus ponens, so we know it's valid. And uh, the premises are obviously true. Uh, every person has some sort of value, in, intrinsic value, and then if I'm a person, then I'm valuable. Okay, so suppose that Mother Teresa said it. You know, it, it sounds sort of nice coming from her. You know that she means it. Uh, you know, you, she lives this out by helping the poor. But suppose that it came out of the mouth of Hitler. Now, Hitler doesn't really value all persons. Uh, you know, he uses persons to um, try to achieve world domination. He even kills persons, commits genocide, you know, kills uh, Jews, the handicapped, the homosexuals, the gypsies. But in spite of the fact that he, you know, doesn't um, seem to believe that all persons are valuable, um, it looks like the argument is still sound. The argument is still good, even if he he, he doesn't um, you know even if he doesn't believe that it's true. The argument is still good. Hello. Okay. So Hitler, if he says this argument, it, does, it doesn't matter um, uh, that he doesn't. live it out, so to speak. Uh, the argument is still good. I mean, it, it matters if he lives it out or not, but it doesn't matter to the soundness of this argument. But, but you should note that not all personal attacks are fallacious. So some personal attacks, as, as we've seen, are fallacious. They, they do commit um, an informal fallacy, but some are not. You know, when you're attempting to establish that someone is unreliable or has a corrupt character, you, you may not be committing a fallacy by attacking the person. Here's an example where you're not committing a fallacy. Millions of innocent people died in Stalin's ruthless ideological purges. Clearly, then, Stalin was one of the most brutal dictators of the 20th century. So, if you're trying to establish that Stalin was a brutal di dictator, of course you're going to have to provide evidence that he, uh, you know, he, he was a brutal dictator. And one way to do that is talk about all the millions of innocent people that he killed. So here, your attack on the person is not fallacious because your attack on the person is relevant to the truth of the conclusion. That's the big difference. Personal attacks are fallacious when the personal attack is not relevant to the claim you're rejecting, the argument rejecting you're rejecting, or the the uh, you know the claim you're trying to establish, it's not relevant. But when it is relevant, when a personal attack is relevant, then the argument you're making um, you know isn't uh, uh, fallacious. So let's look at some personal attacks. 
ad hominem abusive is is one type. This is an attack uh, attack on alleged character flaws of a person instead of a person's argument. So we saw this one already. Uh, John says that the earth is round. Well, you can't be right about that. After all, he cheats on his wife. Okay, so here you can see the issue of relevance. Whether or not John cheats on his wife is irrelevant to the truth of the claim that the earth is round. So to reject John's claim that the earth is round simply because he cheats on his wife would be fallacious. Here we go. Let's watch a video in which an informal fallacy of ad hominem abusive is actually um, committed by our former president, Barack Obama. Let's see if you can spot it. Some tough but successful negotiations with the may have had the opportunity to fully evaluate this treaty. We'll come to the conclusion that this is in the best interest of the United States. Sarah Palin taking aim at your decision to restrict uh, use of nuclear weapons, uh, your pledge not to strike nations, not nuclear nations, uh, who abide by the non-proliferation treaty. Here's what she said. She said it's unbelievable. No other administration would do it. And then she likened it to kids on a playground. She said you're like a kid who says, punch me in the face, and I'm not going to retaliate. Yeah. Your response? Uh, I really have no response to that. Last I checked, Sarah Palin's not much of an expert on uh, nuclear uh, issues. But the strain of criticism has been out there among other Republicans. Okay. So maybe you spotted it. Uh, let's let's analyze what was said, the specific portion that I'm interested in, and we'll see what you think. What is wrong with Obama's response to Palin? George Stephanopoulos says, Sarah Palin, taking aim at your decision to restrict use of nuclear nuclear weapons. And Obama replies, the last time I checked, Sarah Palin's not much of an expert on nuclear issues. Is this a fallacy? I mean, I've said it is a fallacy, but why? Well, whether or not Sarah Palin is an expert on nuclear issues is irrelevant to whether or not her criticism of Obama is good. Let me repeat that. Whether or not Sarah Palin is an expert on nuclear issues is irrelevant to whether or not her criticism of Obama's policy is good. Okay, so even someone who's not an expert might say something true about the issue of which they're not an expert. So for Obama to just um, sort of dismiss it because Sarah Palin's not an expert, is to commit the, the fallacy of, of personal, personal attack. So, sure, you know, maybe it, if Sarah Palin's not an expert on nuclear issues, then you shouldn't really, you know, cite her when you're uh, trying to establish um, some claim about a nuclear issue. You shouldn't say, well, Sarah Palin says this, so it must be true. Of course you're not going to do that. If she's not an expert. But simply because she's not an expert, it doesn't mean that you can just dismiss her claim out of hand. That you just don't even need to consider it. I hope that's clear. That was ad hominem abusive. Now we'll look at ad hominem circumstantial. This is rejecting someone's argument or claim based on the circumstances of their life. For example, political affiliation, educational institution, place of birth, religious affiliation, and income. So you're looking at the circumstances of the person's life, and then you're saying, we don't need to accept what they say. You know, you know, they, they grew up in the Bronx. We don't need to accept what they say. They're uh, Jewish. We don't need to accept what they say. They didn't go to an Ivy League school. All right. That's ad hominem circumstantial because... You know, much, much like the Sarah Palin example, uh, where Obama is not wanting to consider, is not willing to consider uh, Sarah Palin's criticism uh, because she's not much of an expert. Okay, so 
Here's an example. Paul says that there is no evidence suggesting that the legalization of marijuana would have a negative impact on society. Well, don't listen to him. Of course he's going to say that. He's a total pothead. All right. So, so, so what if, you know, like, so what if Paul's a pothead? That doesn't mean that uh, he's wrong, that there's no evidence suggesting that the legalization of marijuana would have a negative impact on society. He could be totally right about that, even if he's a pothead, right? So you shouldn't reject someone's uh, claim simply because of their circumstances. Because the truth of the claim is irrelevant to the given circumstance that they're in. What you need to do is look at the claim itself and ask yourself, is this true or is it false? And just look at the evidence for or against the truth of the claim. Okay, there's also poisoning the well. This is using information about a person's character, circumstance, etc. to warn an audience not to believe anything that person says. Okay, poisoning the well um, occurs before be, before the person you're attacking has a chance to give their case. So let's look at this example. Before you read her article, Stop All Wars, so you see the person is making the attack, before you've had a chance to read the article, Stop All Wars, you should know that the author was arrested six times for protest protesting in front of the Pentagon and the White House. She has also been investigated by the FBI for possible ties to peace movements in other countries, some of which resulted in violence. It's crystal clear that these kinds of people are dangerous and want to destroy our Constitution and take away our basic freedoms. Okay, what you've done here is you've poisoned the well. You've, uh, you've um, given us some reason not to trust what the author says in Stop All Wars. Now suppose all this is true about the author. That doesn't mean that what she says in her article Stop All Wars is false. So yeah, maybe it's helpful to know her background, to know her motivation for writing the article Stop All Wars, to know, um, you know her personal values, that sort of thing. But that doesn't mean you should just initially, you know, um, think that Stop All Wars is a bad article, uh, that there's nothing good in there, that there's nothing true in there. You should say, okay, well, I, you know, I've got that background information on her. I'll keep that in mind as I'm reading Stop All Wars, but I'm going to analyze Stop All Wars on the merits of the claims that the article makes rather than um, reject it because of the character and circumstance of the person who wrote the article. Finally, there's two quo quay. Uh, better said, look who's talking. This is the attempt of one person to avoid the issue at hand by claiming that the other person is a hypocrite. So if, you know, if, um, If your dad comes to you and, and he's, I mean, not that you're going to join a gang, but if your dad comes to you and, and he says, listen, you, you know, uh, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't join a gang. It's dangerous. Um, you might go to jail. Um, you could end up hurting someone. You could end up getting hurt yourself, you know, and, and then you fire back, you know, uh, you've been lecturing me about not joining a gang, but dad, who are you to talk? You were a gang member yourself, so stop lecturing me on what to do. Okay, here the person is not listening to the sound advice given by the dad. Instead, he's saying, you know, I don't have to do what you say. You know, you were a gang member yourself. You're a hypocrite for telling me not to join a gang. This is a very effective response to call someone a hypocrite. You can't tell me to stop smoking. You smoke. It's a very effective strategy to get someone to shut up, but it's not very reasonable in the sense of, you know, going where the evidence leads. 
So even a hypocrite can say things that are true. So even if this dad was still in a gang, he, he might be able to say that gangs are dangerous. In fact, he might be in a better position to say that gangs are dangerous because he knows it firsthand uh, compared to someone who you know has never been in a gang. So although this sort of response to someone's uh, argument or claim is very effective or can be very effective, giving this response shows that one is not willing to go where the evidence leads. Take the smoking example as another example. You know, your dad tells you not to smoke, but he himself smokes a pack a day. You're like, Dad, you can't lecture me on this. Like, you smoke too. I'm going to smoke if I want. Well, what if your dad was saying, you know, smoking kills, smoking causes cancer, uh, smoking makes makes you makes your breath stink or something, you know, makes your um, makes your house stink, that kind of thing. All that he said about smoking is true. So just because the dad still smokes, it doesn't it doesn't mean that smoking's fine. It doesn't mean that smoking's not dangerous. It doesn't mean that there are no bad consequences uh, to smoking. So just because the person who's talking to you uh, is being hypocritical, it doesn't mean that what they're saying uh, isn't you know good, isn't isn't true. So that's two quoque. Here's an example from uh, uh, Donald Trump. I want to ask you about comments you made about the judge in the Trump sure. University sure. case. You said that you thought it was a conflict of interest that he was the judge because he's of Mexican heritage, even though he's from Indiana. Yeah. Hillary Clinton uh, said that that is a racist attack on a federal judge. Oh, I know. She's so wonderful, you know. I mean, here's a woman that should be put in jail for what she did with her emails, and she's commenting on well, this stuff. Let me just tell you something. Let me just tell you something. Very simple. All right. So what's wrong with Trump's initial response to Jake Tapper? If you watch the video, um, he gives a further response. Uh, he tries to actually address uh, the claim that Tapper uh, made. But what, what's wrong with his initial response? Well, let's look at it again. Tapper says, You said that you thought it was a conflict of interest that the judge was of Mexican heritage. Hillary Clinton said, that that is a racist attack on a federal judge. And Trump responds, oh yeah, she's so wonderful, you know, here's a woman who should be put in jail for what she did with her emails, and now she's commenting on blah, 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 right? Notice what Trump did. He did in his answer, he, he took the attention off of himself and put it back on Hillary Clinton. So Hillary Clinton said that Trump's, you know, remarks uh, were a, race, a racist attack on a federal judge, and Trump says something like, look, you know, who is she to talk? You know, she should be in jail, right? Okay, whether or not Hillary should be in jail, whether or not uh, what Trump said was a racist attack on a federal judge, it's not reasonable for Trump to respond to the claim made against him by saying something like, oh yeah, you know, look, look at her. Uh, because whether or not Hillary Clinton um, is impeccable, whether or not Hillary Clinton is leading a moral life, is irrelevant to um, whether what Trump said was racist. All right? So... What's wrong with tu quo que is, is that um, even if the person who makes the attack is a hypocrite, that doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't true or noteworthy, or if it's an argument, it doesn't mean that their argument is bad. So what should be addressed is, is uh, the claim itself, the argument itself. And I suppose we could always talk about whether or not this person is a hypocrite, but that's irrelevant to the truth of the claim or whether or not the argument's good. Okay, so I would challenge you. See if you can come up with an example of one or more of the following fallacies. Ad hominem abusive, 
ad hominem circumstantial, poisoning the well, and tu quo que. I think the key in all of these arguments is that the attack on the person, whether it's on their character, on their circumstances, uh, on them being a hypocrite or attacking a person before they have a chance to, to speak up for themselves, with all of them, the attack is irrelevant to the truth of the claim or the argument that's being made by the person who's being attacked.